Um, so we'll come back together after the work groups and present to each other what we've done uh, and plans moving forward. And then sometime in October, we'll all get together again on the phone or Zoom or whatever um, and present our progress to that date with plans towards uh, papers as sort of a broad overview of what's about to happen. So I realized as I reviewed my slides that when I say nice talks up front, that sort of suggests that my talk in particular is really good or the ones at the beginning, but that's not what I mean. I mean that the entire section of didactics has some really nice talks. Um, I wasn't ranking the talks within the didactics. Um, and then the tutorial, it's a really key learning element for this. And our goal is that everyone will have success in running and interpreting a Bayesian model from their own personal laptop. Um, so we're going to break into work groups that aren't to do the work group things, but specifically to focus on that tutorial. And then we'll come back together after the tutorial and people have run some Bayesian models and interpreted them and asked good questions about what, what am I seeing anyway. And then we'll break into work groups after that and uh, do some work. So the work groups, there's four of them. Um, the first three are Bayesian modeling of one domain with language, exec, and memory. And then the fourth one is incorporating measurement error as the broad topic. And you'll learn a lot more about what those all mean uh, as we're moving forward through these didactics. And we had a really good response rate with the initial surveys. Uh, work group four, based on what people wanted to do, was relatively larger. And if you're somebody who was really kind of ambivalent and picked that more or less at random and would be happier with a smaller learning experience or learning in a smaller group, you might opt to switch out of work group four and into one of the other ones. There's tons of flexibility. So sometimes people come to this moment and they're like, oh, I made a terrible mistake and I'm stuck with this thing that I'm gonna hate and my entire experience is gonna be ruined, which I think is a little, maybe a little too much, but we have lots of flexibility. So if you decide you'd like to have some different work group experience, then that's totally fine and we'll make it all work out. Uh, and we have found, based on experience, that it is not possible to be in two places at the same exact time. So you really do need to pick one work group and not two work groups to be in during Friday Harbor. And at least in theory, you can be on papers that are initiated by work groups that you're not in. Um, there's a ton of enthusiasm during this meeting for all things related to this meeting, and there's this rude thing outside called the real world that that enthusiasm brushes into and uh, encounters post this meeting. Uh, so it, it may be that the real world uh, impedes on the possibility to be on too many of these projects and make a meaningful contribution to multiple um, groups. But at least in theory, there's that possibility. So keep your eyes open and see what cool stuff is going on and if you can help out. All right. So that's my introductory comments. And I was supposed to then have some thoughts on why measurement, why measurement of cognition. So my first thought in encountering this topic is it feels really obvious. We're studying older people and what happens to them and their brains in the context of Alzheimer's disease and other things, or at least that's what I'm doing. And it feels of late that this sort of instinctive, well, of course we have to measure cognition is not being as appreciated by as much by the field, which has introduced things like the ATM framework, which is amyloid, tau, and neuro neurodegeneration. And you notice there's no cognition in that as the very definition of what is Alzheimer's disease. And there's new criteria that were proposed this year at the International Alzheimer's Conference that was like two weeks ago in Amsterdam that go beyond that with other fluid biomarkers, other imaging biomarkers, et cetera, and still cognition seems to be a diminishing afterthought in the field, which I think is concerning. So it makes sense to address this question of why, why are we all here? Why do we think it's important to really use the best statistical methods we can on assessments of cognition? There are other options. So, um, Behavioral observation is a thing that we do. You can come up with some case summary based on interacting with a person for a while and uh, interviewing their informants and you know, discussing things and testing them uh, informally or with formal measures or whatever, uh, and not do what we're doing here, which is to think really hard about 
specific measures of cognition. As soon as we start to come up with studies that are beyond a case study, so when we're trying to have two or more people, we're probably going to need some numbers uh, to combine, to do something. And so we need to turn our observations of behavior into numbers for analyses. And in a broad sense, that's what the uh, formal testing of cognition does. So I think there's two areas that I think of with why do we measure cognition, and that's patient care and research. Uh, and especially patient care, uh, sorry, especially research initially. So we're studying conditions that impact the brains of some older people. And the overarching question that we're trying to assess really, I think, is what are the effects of pathology on brain function? And we rapidly move beyond detailed interviews of each participant to characterize brain functioning, and we need numbers. And so the blessed anecdote here is, so there's a series of papers in the 60s by blessed Tomlinson and Roth in various orders from the UK. And that's really where we started to have after about a half decade of very little research in Alzheimer's disease. These were sort of bringing Alzheimer's disease back onto the research um, radar screen as something of interest. And the relationship between more tangled pathology and more problems with cognition was established at that point. Um, and Blessed was the person who was the psychiatrist involved with assessing the people during life and went to a research, uh, there's a nice oral history from him interview where he talks about going to these research meetings where the pathologists had these counts of tangles and stuff, all this math, all these numbers. And he had his behavioral observations of I interacted with the patient and this is what I saw. He's like, I need numbers. And so Blessed went to the library and figured out what's been assessed before and came up with a bunch of different things to measure. And that's the Blessed Information Memory Concentration Test. And uh, there's others as well that he developed. Um, that he wasn't like writing items from scratch. He was absolutely pulling in what people had already developed in various fields of cognition um, to have some numbers from uh, collecting those sorts of data from patients to have alongside the pathology. So from the very earliest days of clinical pathological sorts of correlation studies, association studies, we have this need to take behavioral observation and transform it into numbers. So uh, this is uh, at the same time as we recognize that the, at the core, there's really a fundamental impossibility of trying to understand anyone's brain functioning. I don't really know how my brain works and I have very little inclination as to how your brain works and your internal thought processes. I can't observe those in any way. Um, and it's really quite daunting to imagine trying to put numbers on this incredibly personal and unobservable thing about how's your brain functioning. Um, and there's a, this famous quote um, about complexity and our brains and the, the ability to understand things and so on. Uh, if the human brain were so simple, we could understand it. We would be so simple that we couldn't understand the human brain. But these questions are really way too important to just throw up our hands and say it's impossible. So I think I come from that place of both profound respect for the difficulty of this task, um, as well as the need to, to move forward and do something practical um, and make some progress. So with cognitive testing, we're reducing human behavior to numbers, to data. And I think it's really important that we appreciate that these are carefully chosen subsets of potential universes worth of data. So we have to choose what sorts of human behavior to try to characterize. We have some amount of goodwill from our participants in research studies, an hour, two hours maybe, that's a lot of cognition. Rush does 19 tests and it takes about two hours for their battery. I think that's probably just about the extent of what you can do in a day. So, and they measure a lot, but they don't measure every possible thing. So choices have to be made. Um, and if you're studying things in other domains that also have respondent burden, you might have to play off 
some other choices that you make. And uh, it's been a, a long time in my career before I had the audacity slash good slash bad luck to need to be the leader of a study and to like make some of these actual choices. Um, it's a humbling thing to figure out what is it exactly that we're gonna measure and how exactly are we gonna do it? Because smart people are gonna come along behind and absolutely say, well, you should have measured this and that and the other thing. And why on earth did you measure it this way? That's stupid. Everybody knows you should measure it this other way or there's this paper that refines that measure. There's just a ton of um, concern that people have about what we measure and how we measure it that's always going on. It's really important. So I think also in thinking about carbon testing, that when we're looking at these data, they're uh, recorded carefully. Uh, and a lot, has, a lot of work is done to consider factors that might threaten the relationships we care about between what we observe and the things we're trying to get at. So controlled environment. So, um, you know, a nice um, normal temperature room with not a lot of distractions, and very much thought about the environment in which the testing is occurring. And that controls for a lot of stuff and eliminates many kinds of noise that would be there otherwise with trained test administrators. And I think that's really important. I, I especially with older people and especially with cognitive functioning, I worry a lot about sort of unsupervised self-assessment. So you, your cell phone buzzes and you have to do a cognitive assessment right then. Well, we've lost a lot of the control of the environment and the person needs to click on whatever themselves. And we don't have this trained person right there looking at the person doing the work and able to say things of like, I think this person was motivated. I think they understood the instructions, all of those kinds of data that we get, metadata around the testing that are really important, again, in eliminating or reducing some of the sources of noise that would interfere with this relationship that we care about. Um, vision and hearing and reading levels, all of the things that are routinely part of cognitive assessment uh, that's really important, I think, in trying to have us do the best science we can of trying to characterize brain functioning. And all of these uh, routine procedures reflect many decades of thinking about cognition and about neurodegeneration. And I think that bullet point was also meant to think about the specific tests. So a lot of the sort of tried and true neuropsych measures have been tried and true for a long time and were very carefully constructed um, and thought about with a lot of the details thought about and a lot of the considerations for what specific words and what specific lengths of tasks and so on that are very carefully constructed. Um, so these are incredibly highly selected data that we're evaluating here. There's a lot of effort at standardization. Um, this was reinforced to me when I asked Emily Trickshu, um, who's a neuropsychologist I work with a lot um, to help us with a new person who was coming on to the ACT study to do some evaluations. And, um, so she got in there with a video camera and a stopwatch and like totally did a lot of work to assess, are we administering these things as intended on, and a lot of that has to do with the timing of, you know, is the delayed recall at the right time when delayed recall is supposedly there. And if you're just looking at the data, you don't produce by that, you don't know that it was administered exactly as instructed. So all of that attention that is uh, ingrained into neuropsychology practice uh, and especially neuropsychology research practice, it's really important to make sure that we're looking at apples and apples across, even within one study across different interviewers. Um, and so there's a lot of work that goes on to try to make sure that these data are really clean in that way, that they represent what they're said to represent. And of course there's like, people have bad days and you know a car crash outside makes it impossible to collect the data at the exact right time or whatever. 
So it's not ever as good as I'm making it out to be, but there's that effort, that intention to make it that clean uh, and that consistent. And then we have the across time thing. So a lot of these studies have been going on for a long time. So the ACT study started in 1994 and it's still going on today. And you know, the, the staff that's collected cognitive data has you know, turned over multiple times. So we really need to make sure that we're doing things um, labeled with the same labels from 1994, we need to make sure we're doing them the same way now. Otherwise, again, this apples and oranges thing where the numbers we're looking at don't mean the same thing. And that's a big problem for trying to uh, infer anything about how the brain's working. Uh, and then across different studies. So as we'll talk about, we're very much involved with harmonizing data and co-calibrating data. So it's on the same metric across multiple studies. And it's a big challenge. It's non, it's certainly non-trivial. It's very difficult. And uh, we're learning a lot about little local idiosyncrasies um, about how data are collected at different sites with purportedly the same name on the instrument. Um, and this is really critical to appreciate and understand so that we're able to account for any differences across studies and how these data are collected. And all of this allows us for the possibility of replication. Because if we just find something in study A, we don't really know very much about the truth in, in the world. And it's really when we have multiple different studies suggesting similar kinds of things that we start to really believe that we've undercome, uncovered some sort of a, a true relationship in the scientific uh, context. So another aspect I think of why do we measure cognition has to do with the definition that I learned of dementia, which has three components. So dementia is an acquired multi-domain cognitive impairment leading to a functional impact for the person's life. So the acquired part means this isn't just a developmental disorder. This isn't mental retardation or whatever terms those sorts of disorders have at this point. It suggests some previous lifetime maximum and a decline from that. So there's some relative impairment that's new. And it would be great if people maybe a few years earlier than I am now have like their neuropsych function evaluated systematically and put that in a can to be used 20 years later as the person may come with complaints so that you can compare it to their midlife max. But usually we don't have those sorts of data uh, when we've got the person in front of us um, sometimes, sometimes we have high school data. Um, I re-listened to Jen's terrific interview with Oregon Public Radio about um, one of her studies where they're capturing data from high school, uh, from assessments in the high school era. So um, really cool where decades have gone by and now we can assess things again. Um, but usually people don't have those data sitting there nicely. So there's a lot of work that's done to sort of infer what someone's pre-morbid ability was to try to get at the sense of an acquired deficit. The multi-domain part, it can't just be memory, it needs to be multiple different domains, and we'll come back to that a little bit. And then the functional impairment part. So this isn't just something you can diagnose with test scores. We need to understand context for the person because um, there's a, a big difference between people and their social uh, demands, their uh, personal demands on their cognition, what, what do they need to do in their life? Um, and if they're catered to, uh, every whim is catered to, it's very difficult to have a functional decline. Um, and if they're taking care of themselves by themselves, then they might need to be on top of their game um, in order to not have a functional impairment. So there's an inexact link between cognition and the impact on functioning. So if we're gonna do any science regarding dementia, I think we really have to characterize cognition. And we also have to characterize other things if we're studying dementia, but cognition is certainly one of them. So uh, note for maybe many of us in the room, our nomenclature is really quite tricky. This, these two words, Alzheimer's disease are used in many, many different ways in the literature. And until you understand what way you're, the person you're talking to or the paper you're reading is using that term Alzheimer's disease, um, you really don't know what you're talking about. 
and I really liked the old nomenclature of dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So this is very much in accord with sort of DSM traditions of reproducible um, observations of people that different interviewers could go interact with the person for a while and come up with a conclusion about what it is they're seeing and put it into a box, a clinical diagnosis that has nothing to do with what the pathologist sees. It's completely a clinical scenario. And so I think that's really helpful. There's also what the pathologist sees. So they may see pathology of the Alzheimer's type. And I think that like if we just called this ATN and its newer uh, manifestation, some flavor of pathology of the Alzheimer's type or evidence of pathology of, or evidence of what's going on in the brain biologically or with these kinds of um, uh, abnormal findings, then that would be really helpful. Um, and it isn't about cognition. It's absolutely about what's going on with the pathology. So the field is moving towards these biomarker definitions of Alzheimer's disease. And if they just called it Alzheimer's pathology, it would make everything a lot clearer and reduce a lot of the confusion that's there with researchers and especially with the public where a lot of our messing, messaging around Alzheimer's disease gets really muddled. Uh, and people don't know that there's this distinction between plaques and tangles or what have you on the one hand and functioning and dementia on the other hand. So the fundamental observation that there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between Alzheimer's pathology and Alzheimer's type dementia confuses everyone. And I have here that some people say preclinical Alzheimer's disease and some say resilience, and that's worth several slides. So I have three columns on my slide here of neuropathology, clinical findings, and the label. So with no neuropathology, you've gotten to late life and your brain looks terrific, good for you. And that's an important state of resistance where you resist what is normative. Most people develop some forms of neuropathology even though most people don't die with dementia. A lot of people die with dementia, but not most people. Most people die without a clinical diagnosis of dementia and some subset of them never develop pathology during life. This other category of some neuropathology, but no clinical dementia, we call resilient in our world. And I think that's a useful term. And then some people develop neuropathology and have dementia, and that gets called uh, dementia or Alzheimer's type dementia, what have you. If you're a gen geneticist and you've used the case control definition of Alzheimer's disease and you've done your GWAS, you've combined two subsets of people who don't have this clinical label of dementia or not dementia. See, so combined resistant and resilient people. And it may well be that there's important distinctions there in the genetic makeup of resisting the pathology in the first place versus the genetic makeup of having the pathology and not having dementia. And we combine all of those together. So control is a heterogeneous mix of multiple different important phenotypes. And this could be one of the reasons that we make kind of slow progress with starting with the case control phenotype, which is where a lot of the genetics world is focused. And in the, in the sort of rubric of the ATN criteria, these same boxes are referred to as not Alzheimer's disease if you have no pathology, and then something they call preclinical AD. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then versus the clinical Alzheimer's disease of the bottom row. So um, it, I've, my physical office is right next to Dirk Keene's office that used to be Tom Montine's office. So I'm physically located right next to a neuropathologist. And um, I think neuropathologists have been incredibly influential in my thinking about the brain and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and 
they start with like the gold standard of the best you can get in terms of what's going on biologically with the brain starts with brain tissue and you slice it and embed it and stain it and look at it or you send it off to the Allen Institute and they do incredible omic stuff and you get this readout eventually about what was going on in this person's brain but that person has died so this notion of preclinical has always irked me if you're looking at autopsy stuff that's from a person who's died so they're not preclinical dementia they either had dementia when they died or they didn't have dementia they're not pre anything they're dead they're never going to evolve so we get into this like counterfactual thought experiment about well if the person had lived longer then we think we would know what happens and we've done enough work at this point i guess maybe with bad data from when people are alive like less precise data than the neural path data to try to predict what's going to happen with people and it's very inexact our uh, crystal balls are not great so why would we give us ourselves such a huge like well but now we know what would have happened if the person had lived and so we're going to perfectly say that this is a preclinical thing so i find that language really confusing um and i find the resistant resilient distinction to be very important um and uh something that i think it's really helpful to measure cognition when we're thinking about this distinction because the difference in the clinical side between no problems and some problems that's pretty broad uh categories and to do something continuous in that space more refined in that space might be a really effective thing and i think a lot of us spend a lot of our research lives kind of right there. So I think, you know, the, the dementia definition talks about function. And I think function is really noisy as a thing to study, as opposed to cognition being a little less noisy or a little bit more tightly linked to what's going on with the brain biology. So there's a non one to one relationship that we've talked about between pathology and cognition. And then a non one to one relationship between cognition and function. Uh, and I think that the cognition is at one step closer to the pathology than the function is. And that the relationships, therefore, are sort of one step closer. And that if we're doing inference about what's going on with the brain and we start with cognition, we're one step closer than starting with function. Even though I care a ton about function, I care much more about how people live in the world in terms of their quality of life and being a human being and so on than I at all do about how they do on some abstract cognitive test. I'd much rather that they're doing great and that my they're doing terrible on my cognitive test than the reverse. They, they would prefer that too. Um, so I'm a big believer in function, but I think from the science perspective, measuring cognition gets you a lot closer to things that are scientifically relevant because there's an awful lot of noise and a lot of other factors. So um, I was talking about breakfast, um, the biggest predictor of nursing home placement, which is a like clear misfunction, like something is going wrong if you need to be placed in a nursing home. And there's a whole constellation of things that might go wrong with that. But the number one predictor is incontinence and nothing to do with um, with cognition at all. And behavioral disturbances are very upsetting for families. And that's not directly linked to the cognition part. So those are the, the biggest predictors of that outcome, which is an incredibly important outcome worthy of study on its own part. But that's multiple steps removed from the brain pathology um, that we're trying to do science about. So all of this leads me to think of cognition as an accessible biomarker. So it's a marker of the underlying biology. And it's not a direct marker of that biology, but an important one. And it's amenable to longitudinal evaluation. And I've written apparently multiple times now that uh, cognition is cheap. And my colleagues from the neuropsychology world jump on me every time, which I appreciate. And they say it's not cheap. It might not cost as much as other things, but this isn't like cheap. Uh, so I mean that in the best possible way, that it's relatively inexpensive to assess uh, and obtain cognition on people. And just some sort of comparator pricing out there as we're trying to think about different flavors of biomarkers. So MRI scans about a grand, 
I don't know how much FTG PET scans are, maybe three grand. An amyloid PET scan might be five grand. It was $5,200 at my hospital a few years ago. It's the last time I looked. Um, and then tau PET scans, uh, the maybe priceless part is after years of concerted effort at the University of Washington, we didn't have tau scanning. Uh, and I've been to multiple meetings with dean level president of our like whatever level people around the table, the head of radiology, their head of uh, nuclear chemistry and stuff for the university and couldn't get tau tracer um, in Seattle. And Seattle's not like a backwards medical city. And I think we're gonna get for tau Sapir now after some failed efforts or uh, unfortunately unsuccessful efforts at a different tracer. Like it's, it's not simple and it's not FDA approved yet. So it may be priceless, it may be impossible to obtain. Once it's available, maybe it's about similar to an amyloid scan around $5,000. That's pretty expensive data for one time point. And CSF is invasive. If you're going to do a lumbar puncture and there's about 1% rate of people needing to have a blood patch where they inject blood into the cerebral spinal space in order to deal with a profound headache that people can get from the volume reduction, the volume removal of the fluid that, you know, it has a physiological purpose of buffering the brain. Um, so that happens at a predictable rate. And there are more serious complications where you can damage the dura and have a dural leak. Um, and those don't happen often, but they happen. So now we've gone from like thinking about what's going on in the brain to potentially hurting somebody and uh, you know having some pr pretty profound, you can kill people. And it doesn't happen like often. It's not like you have a hundred percent rate of that, but it's concerning from like a prospective cohort study of people who are just volunteering. Um, we really hesitate a lot to do things where we could actually kill them. And then with plasma biomarkers, I think it's really exciting. Uh, I think that the availability of these is absolutely where the field will need to go um, because all these other things I think are just not scalable. Uh, and so you know, we're incumbent, it's incumbent upon the field to really understand these, but it's pretty early days of these technologies. We don't know really what we're looking at yet. And we'll certainly need a panel. I don't think we'll be able to have one plasma biomarker and you know, that's the holy grail to understand what's going on in the brain. It's gonna be much more complicated than that. So it's gonna take a panel and probably that's gonna be hundreds of dollars. And, you know, we're, I'm a clinician, I'm internist and we spend a lot of money on lab tests and we don't think we can, have just one lab test, we need 30 lab tests. And yeah, it's gonna cost some money to get good data to characterize what's going on with people to try to take good care of them. So I'm not worried about, you know, like the, the price tag is too high or something, but just compared to cognitive functioning, that's gonna be more expensive than trying to grab really good research quality uh, estimates of cognitive functioning. And we, I talked a little bit about autopsy and I, you know, they're really priceless. So um, Dirk ends his talks with, profound gratitude for brain donors and their families who've made what he calls the ultimate gift to science. And I, I think there's a lot to that. It's amazing what we can do with brain tissues, but they're not longitudinal and they're way too late, obviously, to have any impact on what we do for that particular person. So they're incredibly important on the research side, but clinically, we don't know. And Dan's giving me a five finger thing, which I think means mm -hmm. running out of time. Uh, participants don't love cognitive assessments, but they do tolerate them and they understand why we're doing what we're doing. So it may not be a big shock to some of the people in the room that measuring brain functioning with tests is hard. And it turns out the brain does a lot of different things. And the conditions we're talking about have variable brain anatomical relationships and it's not simple. Especially early in my career, I thought a lot about global cognition. What if we could reduce all of the things that the brain's doing to one number. And now I really think a lot about multiple uh, different domains. So memory, exact language, and visual spatial, which we've started to abbreviate as MELV. I don't know why. And maybe attention or other factors, behavior. It's really interesting. Each of these has several aspects involved. So there's people who spend their lives focused on language, per, for example, and think it would be incredibly presumptuous to summarize all of language performance with a single number. And there's a lot to that. Uh, and neurodegenerative processes certainly don't uh, seem to have global impacts on each of these. 
different people have different patterns of problems and evolution of each of these things over time, which makes the idea of summarizing all of this into one number really quite problematic. So I'm gonna conclude, I have four slides left or maybe five, math is hard, is hard um, about sort of why are we here at a Bayesian conference given all of the previous things. And I think of myself initially in my career as a data scavenger where it was efficient to examine existing data and replication matters a lot and genetics, which I think is fascinating and important, requires massive sample sizes way beyond any particular study. And each study has its own battery with its own little idiosyncrasies. And there's been lots of efforts to harmonize data collection. And Gerald is here in the third row and was very much involved with the consortium to establish a registry for Alzheimer's disease, which we all think of as CIRAD. There were people behind that and meetings and an effort to really standardize what is it we collect on the neuropsych side, on the neuropath side, et cetera. Um, it really important groundwork that led to things like the uniform data set. Um, and its evolution over time where Alzheimer's centers are now mandated to collect a subset of things all the same way that's evolved over time. Like there's a lot of work that's happened to try to standardize things. And those efforts have been partially successful, but there's also like data that happened before then that would matter if we're trying to characterize longitudinal functioning in people who've been evaluated before we happen to have like the magic bullet uh, data set or data collection procedures. And modern psychometric tools that we focused on in previous episodes of what used to be Friday Harbor and SciMCA are particularly appropriate for harmonizing these really vast oceans of data. But there's still a lot of variation across studies and within studies on the intensity of measurement within each domain. Um, and co-calibration really elegantly addresses the metric concerns about what level is this person's memory functioning, for example. But the problem of differential precision is still quite quite a bit there and work group four really will be addressing that um, this year. So I'm very excited about that part. So there's been lots of interest in longitudinal evaluation. I think that's really important, especially as we're studying neurodegeneration, which is an evolution over time of uh, brain structure and brain function that's downstream from that. Um, and so a study might add some tests of a domain and so later assessments have better precision than earlier ones. And we have tests with uneven precision again across the range of abilities of study participants, where if you have a decline over time, you might move from an area of worse precision to an area of better precision within one test. And we don't typically account for that. So I'm hoping to learn something about neurodegeneration, which can be assessed over time. And Bayes seems particularly adept at uh, addressing this longitudinal issues and the complexity there. So much data and the need for Bayes. So our frequency approach to date treats item parameters. So we characterize things about the items and then we use that to generate scores. And we treat those item parameters as if the first time we encounter them in a big study and we choose which study very carefully and so on, but then we treat them as if they're fixed and known as opposed to updating our parameter estimates based on additional studies that have administered these same exact items. So our cumulative experience across multiple studies doesn't have an impact on our measurement models. And that feels really wasteful that we're just ignoring ways to refine and improve on our measurement models. And because of the complexity of the measurement task and the difficulty of really taking longitudinal data into account, we, we throw away all but a single time point for each person, which also feels incredibly wasteful. Um, it's a lot simpler to model with only one time point per person. But if you've got someone who's got 15 evaluations, you're you know, just dipping a teaspoon into this vast ocean of data to try to say something. And Bayes seems magically able, and we'll get into how much magic there is, to incorporate longitudinal data and update our posteriors for item parameters which adds value from each data set's experience of using each item, which sounds really cool to me. Uh, so very briefly on treating patients. So I had research and then clinical practice. So I'm a clinician and a physician and diagnosis at the individual patient level may not require research quality cognitive assessment and it may not be possible. So I work at a safety net hospital. We've got people coming from all over the world and you've got somebody who's a Somali immigrant and 
they bring their mom into clinic and uh, there's no way we're gonna have research quality tests in Somali developed tomorrow. It's just not gonna be feasible. So we have to do what we can with the tools we have. And it may not be possible to have research quality cognitive stuff for everybody. And that may not be necessary. We should be able to treat that person's mom and figure out what's going on and so on with our tools um, that may not be research tools. And we wanna treat people with drugs and other interventions and trials are incredibly important and will be more important now in this era where we have the beginnings of medications that can actually have an impact on the biology or on some aspects of the biology. There's so much that we're gonna learn in the coming years. And embedded within each of the domains we'll be studying here are elements from the ADAS COG. And that's important because the ADAS COG is the instrument that the drug companies use to determine whether they think their drug is working. And they use it with a total score and they combine aspects from the ADAS COG combines, drug companies aren't combining, the ADAS com COG combines multiple elements from multiple different aspects of cognition together in one global cognitive uh, score that is on a you know, classical test theory model. And it's like, that's so bad. So uh, I say all of those things and it's analyzed if it had linear scaling properties and as if it was measured with no error. And there's so many issues and we can do better. And we owe it to our patients and to all patients to do better than total scores on the ADAS COG. And I think Bayes can help a lot in helping us with this. So my conclusions, understanding brain functioning is both op impossible and not optional. Cognition is a particularly valuable longitudinal biomarker of brain function. And there's tremendous variation across studies in the specifics of how cognition is assessed. And there's tremendous need for harmonization and for co-calibration. And the limitations of that work that I'm very familiar with really suggest a potential role for Bayes in that space. And measurement error and precision is almost always ignored in the work that we do, almost always. And that's a problem. We're lying to ourselves and we're ignoring precision to our peril and our patient's peril. Longitudinal data are particularly valuable for the kinds of scientific questions we have about cognition and Bayes seems really helpful in that context. And outcomes for trials is a really huge issue and incredibly relevant right about now in the history of the world where we've got the first um, you know, medications that seem to have an impact. So I'm for one, and I expect many of you share this, I'm so excited to be here to learn about tools that can help us solve a lot of our problems and it should be a terrific week. So thank you. Um, and we have a few minutes for break. And if so there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for questions and this is like a high level overview. So if people do have questions in that context, that'd be great. Well, let's, let's do questions. We have yep. time. There's time in the schedule this morning. Could you use the mic? And speakers, please repeat those. Yeah. Hang on. Dan's going to bring you the mic, and you're going to speak directly in the mic, and then I'm going to repeat your question. And please tell us who you are and where you're from. So my, my name is Stephen Shell. I'm a professor at Colorado State University. I work in cognitive aging and longitudinal research methods. Uh, we've had a couple of machine learning studies comparing different cognitive abilities as predictors of other health outcomes against biomarkers and other socioeconomic conditions, things like that. And cognitive measures consistently rank in the top um, for predicting mortality risk, depression risk, things like that. Um, and yet there is, there does seem to be this strong bias in the medical community about assessing cognition alongside um, physiological measures and things, things like that. So given that you seem to also kind of be on this same wavelength of wanting to be a proponent for assessing cognition for that purpose, what do you think is going to be necessary to, to have that as a uh, more as a default setting in a medical context or a clinical context? So the question was, 
um, that cognition seems really valuable, but the field seems to be moving in a different way. How can we make it so that the field appreciates the value of cognition? And I think specifically you were focused on maybe the clinical world. I think we saw with COVID that the clinical world can change on a dime when it's proven to be important. So during COVID, I had the privilege of treating patients and reviewed with my team on the day after the infectious disease team had found one of our patients who got one of the antibody treatments for COVID. And we reviewed a like systematic review of 60 some anti-COVID antibody treatments that had been studied to that point. And this was like a year and a half in, and there was like published data already. And we were making evidence-based choices about which specific antibodies. And there was a panel of two of them that were combined in the thing that was available for this. I think he was a Somali speaking patient uh, to get treated uh, and it was phenomenally cool. So we can adapt very quickly and we will see with the infusion stuff, this is gonna pr uh, require profound changes to how we treat people with Alzheimer's type pathology where infusion clinics and availability of space in the neuro ICU and a new generation of neuroradiologists who are gonna be trained on ARIA and stuff like that all because there's this new opportunity to treat people. And that none of that existed four years ago or three years ago or one year ago. So we're gonna see the clinical enterprise change just like that when there's data that suggests that we can improve people's lives. So I think, I don't think we need to do any sort of public like pounding on tables or whatever and touting the value of our stuff. We just need to demonstrate the value of our stuff is my own view about how this actually works.